আচ্ছা দাঁড়াও গো লাইভ অপশন এসছে এক সেকেন্ড এবার হবে হ্যাঁ আমরা এখন লাইভ কামিনী একবার চেক করে নাও আমার এখানে এখনো কিন্তু ওয়েটিং দেখাচ্ছে না হয়ে গেছে লাইভ আচ্ছা এই যে এখন লাইভ হ্যাঁ এটা দেখালো নোটিফিকেশন সো আমরা স্টার্ট করি ম্যাডাম স্টার্ট করছি তাহলে ওকে uh welcome everyone this is our 43 webinar in this race uh we are very glad that uh, today we have a very eminent scientist and renowned scientist uh, in the world uh, and also in the bangladesh in uh, professor hasina khan ma'am uh, today uh, shoma and our very close friend uh, to us dr tamina islam from bangladesh uh, uh, the university of dhaka also help us to hosting this webinar successfully and uh, uh, as you everybody as you know or if you are new in the bioengine we provide a password after the talk which is uh, applicable uh, which is applicable for the certificate application or feedback submission so waiting please keep patient uh, at the end i am sure multiple time i give the talk and there is a alternation uh, in january onwards we are not giving the password we directly give the link for the certificate application to uh, just minimize the um, uh, procedure or it make so simple so i request uh, tamina to introduce bioengine little bit and uh, introduce our speaker tamina please thank you shubha good morning everyone Welcome to Biongene, a platform from which researchers and scientists can present their research to the world and future scientists can gain knowledge, perspective and inspiration. We are doing this through webinars and publications. Thank you for being a part of today's webinar series. As more people are joining in, let me provide some housekeeping information related to today's webinar. Please note that after attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation. For this, you need to submit the feedback form that you received after the webinar registration. You need to enter a password in the form that will be provided multiple times in the YouTube chat after the presentation. When you fill out the feedback form, please remember to mention that the full name of your institution and the full institute address. You can collect your participation certificates after two, three days from our website. Bioengine does not provide any certificates through email. Please make sure that you, you have enabled YouTube chat on your device so that you can interact and submit your webinar related questions. We will collect all the relevant questions for our speaker. Connect with Bioengine via Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The topic of our today's webinar is Jude and the World Within by renowned plant scientist, Professor Hasina Khan, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Hasina Khan, a UGC professor, has been recognized by the Government of People's Republic of Bangladesh with the Independence Day Award 2019, the highest civilian award of the country for her unique contribution to research and training. She has received the Kazi Mahabubullah Gold Medal in 2016 and Bangladesh Academy of Science M.O. Ghani Memorial Gold Medal in 2011. She was one of the team leaders of the Jude Genome Project. She, with the help with a, of an international team, decoded the Hilsha fish genome and was the first group to publish the genome findings. Her team successfully reduced the expression of some jute genes involved in the lignin biosynthetic pathway. Such jute lines will be useful in paper pulping and in using jute as a source of biofuel. Her lab has also reported the existence of a diverse array of endophytic microbial communities in jute and this exploration have found such microbes to be high yielding and pristine sources for commercially invaluable bioactive compounds. She has over 100 publications in peer reviewed journals. She was the first chairperson of the Department of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, University of Dhaka. She has served in the first National Executive Committee on Biotechnology 2004 to 2006, advising on the application of biotechnology in national development. She helped in the development of the National Biotechnology Guidelines. She is a member of the Board of Governors of the National Institute of Biotechnology 
and also the member of National Technical Committee on Biotechnology 2016 to till date. She is a fellow and now the secretary of Bangladesh Academy of Sciences and the fellow of the World Academy of Science. She was a visiting professor at the South Asian University at New Delhi, India. We are highly honored to have her with us today. Now I request Professor Hasina Khan to please share her screen and begin her talk. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you so much, Tamina. Thank you, Shubho. Thank you, Shoma, for the invitation to join Bayanjin. And I'm really honored to be here and present my talk on Jute. Uh, let me share, start sharing, okay. So once again, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm speaking from USA, so it's evening here. And I'm delighted to be talking about my work on Jute and the world within. Mm, Jute for Bangladeshis, let me make full screen. Okay. For Bangladeshis, uh, Jute is not just a product which fetches foreign currency, it's our identity. It's uh, the maxim that we have, Shunar Bangla or Golden Bengal, it is linked to that. And for ages, it has been linked with our quest for economic liberation. And we have so many folklores based on jute because of the golden luster that it imparts when these uh, fibers, after they have taken out from the stock and they spread out on the fields to dry, it assumes a beautiful golden luster. And from there, also, we have this name, Golden Bengal of Shunar Bangla. So what is jute? It is a long, um, shiny, uh, and very soft vegetable crop, and it attains uh, this uh, huge biomass. It attains a height of about one to four meters uh, with a diameter between 17 to 20 millimeter. It attains this huge biomass in just within four months. And it is self-pollinated, and it belongs to the uh, Malvasi family. This is a little biology of jute for you. And it, it belongs to the genus Corcorus, and there are over 170 Corcorus species, but only two are cultivated, and we get jute fiber from only two of them, which is Corcorus capsularis, white jute, and Corcorus caps, uh, auditorius, which is Tosha. And they both have different attributes. If one is very uh, shiny and has a luster, uh, which is golden in color, the other has a strong uh, ability to resist insects, pets, and others. So the, they have different attributes, and but they are not cross compatible. That's a big problem. I'll come to it later. Uh, jute fiber. Uh, I think you will know this person here, Mubarak Ahmed Khan. Uh, so he's been working on uh, making jute plastic bags. So this uh, jute fibers, it has very uh, well-known and tested attributes. It has a strong textile strength. It is resistant to shearing and it uh, absorbs moisture and um, it's non-toxic in nature. And we have, we haven't, I think we still haven't made all the diverse uses we can use it, uh, use jute for, but still we have so many uses of jute. It is used in carpet backings and making shopping bags. And as I said, Professor Mubarak Ahmed Khan is making plastic uh, bags out of jute. So my, uh, and the other uh, uses of jute, jute bags have been used for embankment for ages. Then we use it for road construction in, helping the drainage system. And even this uh, French company, this was in 2019, but I think since uh, COVID-19, it has uh, been halted a little because we haven't heard much about it, but this French company was very interested in using jute fiber from Bangladesh to make uh, car parts of top automobile marquee names like Toyota, Ford, and Volkswagen. So uh, with this background, uh, let me start um, my journey, tell you about my journey on the jute molecular biology, which started in 1996. At that time, I was introduced 
to the uh, wonders of uh, Jude because we had this huge uh, treasure trove of uh, germ plasm collection. It was it was made by the International Jute Organization, which had its headquarters in Dhaka, and the, they had this gene bank made in the Jute Research Institute. And I was introduced to it by my student, who the, my first PhD student, uh, who was at that time was a young scientist at the Jute Research Institute, but since now he's retired. But so we had this so many germplasm collection, all with different attributes. And obviously we did have at that time, this was almost 25, 26 years ago, much molecular biology work done on jute. So I was thinking if I wanted to know uh, the difference at the DNA level these uh, jute germplasms have, I need to start by doing some molecular level work. But how do I start? How do I start doing PCRs to do use markers to find the differences? Because we didn't have any markers developed at that time. So I started with the very basics. And most of you attending this seminar would be like wondering, RAPD, because does it work? Because this is something only based on 10 nucleotides and the mm, annealing temperature would not be very high, so it not, would not be reproducible. But still, I was quite lucky in using this RAPD primers. I'll come to it later. So I started off by using primers which were non-specific, uh, were not dependent on the sequence so they were kind of non-specific like RAPD, AFLP, ISSR, and others. But as I said, I was quite lucky. Using those primers, the first lesson of uh, jute biology uh, genetics that I had was jute is, uh, uh, there's very little diversity within the uh, jute species. You could differentiate between the two cultivars, Corcorus olitorius and Corcorus capsularis, but you couldn't differentiate between olitorius or capsularis. So that's the first lesson I had, but still I was very happy that the markers we were using could differentiate between the, uh, uh, the two cultivars. Then uh, we, we went on uh, to make some uh, genomic libraries to and enrich them for uh, SSR, the simple sequence repeats to have some reliable markers which were co-dominant in nature, which were reproducible. So we developed some SSR markers. We got about 192 clones, which had SSR sequence. We had enriched for SSRs. And we then um, we sequenced those clones and searched for the presence of the repeats. And we found some good uh, SSR markers from them. So again, we were... Uh, with, even with these markers, we were able only to differentiate between the corcorus capsularis and olitorius. But in fact, it, we were getting better results in differentiating within the species with these markers. So this was the beginning of jute molecular biology work. But what happened here, the, since we already got some clones uh, from the genomic libraries, we started analyzing those sequences. And those were our first bioinformatics studies that we started almost 20 to 25 years ago to find out what the sequences carried, if there were sequences of genes, if there were any promoter sequences. So that was our first exposure to some bioinformatics studies. So, and with the uh, markers that we developed, I wondered if we could use them to find out uh, any differences at the DNA level for some, um, this was a, a few jute uh, germplasm collection that would germinate below 20 degrees centigrade. And that's something unique for jute because jute is a hot summer, uh, humid uh, loving um, crop and it grows only in the summers. So, in, Germinating below 20 degrees was you could uh, grow them in the winters in, our, in Bangladesh. So we, I wanted to find out those germplasm accessions that they were there, which could germinate below 20 degrees centigrade. Could we develop any markers for them to differentiate, uh, to find out at the DNA level, the differences between them? And as I said, I was quite lucky. You may call it beginner's luck. These are the... Uh, 
four germ plasm collection. This is one of the students from the Department of Botany, Dr. Selina Begum. She was working at the Jute Research Institute. She had done this work initially where she showed that these four uh, accessions could germinate below 20 degrees C. In fact, they were germinating at 16 degrees C. And the two pharma popular varieties, they don't. Okay. So I use the RAPD primers that I had already generated to find out if I could see any differences. And I was lucky to find that uh, all the four uh, uh, accessions were germinated at uh, below 16 degrees, um, at 16 degrees centigrade. They had this extra band, which was not which was missing in the ones which did not germinate at that temperature. So we were wondering, does this band have anything to do with the low temperature tolerance? So what we did, we went on to do a crossing between the sensitive and the tolerant one. And we were again found that those which were germinating at 16 degrees centigrade, they had this uh, extra band, while those which were not germinating did not have this band. So we knew there was some influence of this presence of this band so we decided to excise the, that band and sequence it. But as you may know, uh, it wasn't very straightforward at that time because uh, this is RAPD primer. And for RAPD, you use, you use only one primer for uh, amplification. Why? Because uh, it's uh, supposed uh, that uh, one primer, only 10 nucleotides in length, would find another sequence in reverse within an amplifiable region. So one primer would be enough. So if you use one primer for uh, amplification and using that primer for, for sequencing would not work. So at that time, we didn't have any um, TA vector or anything at hand. And so we did some primer walking and it was quite difficult. In fact, we did the se um, sequencing and then the sequence analysis. This is the... Uh, that sequence, uh, that band, it was 100 and, uh, 1200 bases in length. And we did the sequencing and, and bioinformatic tools were not that refined at, time, at that time. So it was very difficult for us to find within this region an exon which matched with the Arabidopsis uh, sequence. We later found that it was a, a VPS, a vesicular sorting protein. It matched exactly with that. But this was only part of a last exon. This was only the last exon and we had introns there. So we slowly, slowly walked the whole uh, sequence through and then we found the, this is the coding sequence now with the chromosome walking to find the whole sequence, some three prime races, five prime races to find the sequence. And we, we it's a 1500 uh, amino acids long, uh, 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 protein. It is known as VPS, as I said, VPS 51. And uh, this was from the sensitive 9897. It's the one which does, did not germinate at uh, uh, 16 degrees centigrade. And for the one which germinated at 16 degrees centigrade, we found most of the sequence were similar, except there was 12 amino acids more in the sensitive one and which was missing in the tolerant variety, uh, tolerant accession. So we also did some other work, some quite in details, and we found there was a copy number variation. There were more copies uh, present in the 201. This was what we found from the intronic variations that we found. So we knew there were more copy numbers in 2015, which was the low temperature tolerant one. And there was there seemed to be only a copy or so in, in the sensitive one. At the moment, we are doing the sequencing of both the, uh, we have 9897 at hand, which is the one which has been published. And we are now sequencing the 2015, the tolerant one to find out at the genomic level more differences. And we also are working on the heterologous expression of this. So I'll stop there on this story because it's still an ongoing one. And now, as I said, we were we had all those sequences had at hand, and we were doing the analysis of those genomic sequences that we were getting from Jude. And so we and we also had a 
flavor of doing some bioinformatic analysis. So we were quite ready to take on the task of doing the whole genome sequencing of Jude. And then there was Dr. Maksud Alam, who was armed with all the expertise of doing the sequencing of the um, transgenic papaya in Hawaii. And then in Malaysia, he worked on rubber genome. And so we together, I worked out on the uh, Jude genome sequencing. We, it was announced, it was a very big event in Bangladesh, the first mega project of Bangladesh. Even the prime minister was uh, made a big announcement in 2010 in the parliament. And the sequence data was made public much later in 2017. And since then, we have had sequence data from India, then followed by China. Springer recently has published a book and Tahmina has a, a chapter in it and it's going to be coming out soon where all the uh, data from the genome sequence has been published. So we have uh, the whole genome sequences. We know of many, we, by that time we knew of some genes which were quite good, uh, uh, which was present in one and non present in the other. So we were like, excuse me. Uh, so since the two jute cultivars, they have such good attributes among themselves are not cross compatible. So the only solution it seemed at that, that time was doing some transgenic work. But unfortunately, uh, a long time had been spent by a very renowned researcher, my colleague at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, Dr. Seva Siraj. She had worked, uh, she had put in a lot of efforts and um, time to work on, on the transformation of jute, but jute appeared to be very recalcitrant to tissue culture. So at that time, I was thinking we, if we have to improve jute and if transgenic was the answer, then what to do? And we became aware at that time that there were some publications coming out where you would copy nature as like a, where there is a wound in the plant and the agrobacterium infects there and um, introduces its T DNA through that mechanism. So we followed something similar. Some of the literature was saying that this was quite uh, successful. So we, what we took, we did this implant uh, transformation method and it worked quite well in which you take the early young jute plants and injure them at the root tips. And then after uh, an hour or so you make uh, another injury and you put in the suspension of the uh, uh, agrobacterium tumor patients with your desired, this was a marker gene, we started with Gus. And then it worked quite, quite well. In fact, I can't seem to remember the exact number, but it was between 30 to 40% the transformation efficiency. And it was working well, we, we did all the uh, tests to find it was working well. So we now, we were armed with the sequences uh, and we knew that transformation was working. So next, what we did, we used the jute genome sequencing and also the sequences of other uh, plants and worked out, uh, found the lignin biosynthetic pathway in jute. Why lignin? Why did we want, why, why were, were we interested in lignin? So I'll come to that later, but uh, for the lignin uh, biosynthetic pathway, there are 10 genes, 10 enzymes involved. Uh, uh, in this uh, biosynthetic pathway. And we targeted four, uh, four of the genes of this pathway, four which the literature say did not overlap with, uh, um, uh, did not compromise its ability to stand straight because lignin helps the plant stand up straight to ability to insect, uh, prevent insect infestation, infestation. So those four genes we identified and we targeted them for down regulation using the technique at that time, which was quite novel, using artificial microRNA and siRNA. We used those approaches uh, to reduce lignin. Why reduce lignin? Um, because we wanted to value add jute fiber. So how would, how would lignin uh, decrease, increase the value of jute fiber? Because it's still a dream of mine that if we could reduce lignin to an extent where the stiffness would be reduced and we could consider uh, jute as a 
textile fiber because reduced lignin, it increases elasticity. We could also think of using it in paper pulping. Paper pulping jute has been used, but a lot of harsh, harsh chemicals are used for uh, removing the lignin. So if the lignin is reduced, you'd not need so much use of the chemicals, which, excuse me, which damage the environment. And also this is another dream I have that if we ever think of uh, um, biofuel and jute, which attains a huge biomass in just four months could be used, could be considered for biofuel. And again, reduced lignin has this impact of increasing cellulosic biomass to some extent. So with all those, um, uh, considerations in mind, uh, we decided to use the jute genome sequence and the transformation protocol that we had at hand to reduce the lignin. And we, this is the four, we targeted four genes using these two methods, artificial microRNA and siRNA. And we were quite successful in doing that. This is the plant in a, in a pot. It's not growing, looking very healthy, but uh, we didn't have access to any uh, field, so we were doing our work in the under uh, confined conditions because these are transgenics. So uh, what we did from those transgenic lines, we did all the morphological analysis. We now we have the them up to T seven generation for one and T five for the other. For one, I mean one using the artificial microRNA, and for the other siRNA. But four uh, jute lines, four enzymes we targeted, genes we targeted using these two different approaches. So we did uh, one is up to the T7 transformation generation seven and the other is at five. So we did the morphological analysis, we did all the microscopic analysis, chemical analysis, determining the lignin content reduction, cellulose increase or enzymatic sacrification. We also did a scanning electron microscopy to see how the fibers looked after lignin reduction and also we did the mechanical analysis. Okay, so uh, I'm not too sure if this, uh, um, we repeated it once, but didn't get it to be exactly like this, but we thought when, when the lignin was reduced, the luster was much improved. Uh, and this is the control where the lignin has not been uh, tinkered with and it didn't seem as bright, but uh, I must tell you that we repeated it once again, we didn't get exactly the similar, so I cannot, I mean, vouch to that, it gets much brighter or not. So we went on, uh, as I said, we uh, measured the lignin, the lignin in the whole stem. This is the whole stem, uh, was reduced by about 25%. And lignin in the fiber was reduced to about 12 to 13%. And also, um, fluorogluconol uh, staining, uh, which uh, st uh, stains uh, the um, hydroxycinamaldehyde at the end of the lignans, purple. So that suggested the control uh, was uh, much brighter than the transgenic ones. These are the transgenics. The numbers here, COMT or C4H, these are the enzymes that we targeted. So they're the abbreviation of the enzymes that were targeted or the genes that were targeted. And then we measured the cellulose. Cellulose seemed to increase, not significantly, but still there was an increase. And again, with staining with uh, chlorocalcofluor trying to remember the names of the stains. And the control was uh, not as bright as the transgenic ones, which suggested the, and also it uh, matched with the data we had for measuring the cellulose content. We did, as I said, um, scanning electron microscopy studies and this is the control where the lignin surface, the surface of the stem looked quite smooth, whereas the, the others you can see inside 
the exposure of the lignin fibrils because of the uh, ex exposure of the fibrils because of the removal of lignin. So at this point, uh, um, I'm waiting to write for the biosafety clearance. This is a long drawn out process and it puts you off. So I've been putting it off for long, but I need to write for the biosafety clearance and once we get that I think this will be good uh, we as we have seen the mechanical strength is good the luster seems to improve slightly the cellulose content is improved so we think this will have great commercial value uh, this is uh, transgenic and talking about transgenics uh, most of us working on um, transgenesis will agree that it did not live up to the hype that it had created. There was so much hype involved, like at the time we started with the transgenic crops that it would help to alleviate many problems, especially mitigate the biotic and abiotic stress problems. But all these uh, strategies for doing transgenic work uh, assume this underlying fact that uh, jute uh, not jute, for any plants, uh, they combat stress on its own. But it's not true, not true anymore, because we now know this host of microorganisms that live within a plant has a huge influence on the uh, on mitigating many of the problems. So if we consider plant, plant on its uh, as an entity uh, and target uh, have uh, approaches targeted considering plant as an entity is not going to work. So in that uh, aspect, I, um, I shifted gear. The reason for shifting gear was not designed as such. Uh, while I was doing my uh, genome sequencing work, we were getting lots of sequences which were matching with bacteria. And I was like a ma uh, very surprised. And as a, any supervisor, you first think it's a problem with your students. They are sloppy in nature. They did uh, some contamination. So you're getting so much uh, sequence uh, sequences which were matching with uh, microbes when you were supposed to be getting only plant genome sequences. And, but I later realized that I was wrong. Those genome sequences of microbes were coming from the plants within the microorganisms living within jute. And the, uh, it's considered to be a renaissance now, this uh, plant microbiome studies. And this microbiome is mainly the endophytes, the microbes, uh, bacteria or fungi that reside within the living tissues of a plant. And uh, I mean, they have this, uh, uh, because they are, uh, they have this intimate relationship with plant and they co, they have most likely, most likely they co-evolve with the plant host. So what has happened is acquire these um, attributes of uh, uh, enhancing the plant biomass, um, enhancing tolerance to different stresses and enhancing acquisition to nutrients. So these are the attributes that um, has caught the attention of so many scientists now. And microbial products are expected to drive the next wave of agricultural crop renovations. For a long time, this, the fertilizers and the agrochemical industries, they had this long history of uh, uh, improving uh, food availability or quality, but they are facing so much challenges due to the shrinking uh, 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 land, uh, agricultural lands, and then the climate change attributes, and also the organisms which are becoming resistant to these uh, agrochemicals. So as I said, the next wave of agricultural crop innovations are going to come from microbial products and the benefits of the plant microbiome, for example, in promoting plant growth and for controlling pathogens, they are becoming increasingly significant. Um, we may not know much about uh, what goes in, in these interactions, but it is creating a lot of uh, promise of this uh, potential of the potential use in agriculture and mitigating. Um, biotic and abiotic stress problems. 
And I think the next decade will provide key learnings as how we translate this microbiome. Still now, we've not had much report on this translational aspect, but I think given a few more years, uh, we'll uh, know how to translate microbiomes, and this is going to become a big field in agriculture. It's going to mature soon. Excuse me. In this aspect, let me talk about my work on jute microbiome. So this is unveiling the world of the endophytic community. This is the world within jute. Uh, plants are not no longer standalone entities. I mean, none of us are. No, a eukaryotic organism is a standalone entity anymore. We all are meta-organisms. And for a healthy plant, it has this host of dynamic composition of microbiome. And this is a such dense network of multitropic interactions. So much so, I mean, the microbiome is 10 times more the, uh, than uh, the genome size of the microbiome is 10 times more than that of the plant. And you can imagine the scale. And there are many, we all know about what the endophytes do, the relationship with plants. I'll talk to you about my work on jute. And we started with identifying of isolating jute endophytes from all the tissues of jute, from its seeds, from its stem, from its leaves, from its flowers. And we have this collection, quite good collection. Of course, it's not ex exhaustive. Uh, this is not any metagenomics work. This is only based on culture, uh, the organisms that we could culture. And they're quite good and diverse. We got many fungi and many bacteria. And we started work on them to find out what role they have in promoting jute growth or um, controlling, uh, helping in biocontrol. So we started off by screening a number of bacterial isolates and endophytes, and we found they were doing quite well in improving jute growth. This is jute growing under normal conditions, and this with the inoculation of bacteria, we just have this number here at the moment, back, back six, and it was helping in improving jute growth. And they were making, fixing nitrogen, making uh, siderophores, they were uh, making indole acetic acid, they were making phos phosphorus available, making phosphorus soluble, and they were also capable of uh, controlling some uh, um, fungi, pathogenic fungi. So one Burkhold area, it caught our attention because Burkholdia is known as a human pathogen. It caused an immunocompromised individual. It can cause um, cystic fibrosis. And we were surprised that this was doing quite well in improving uh, jute growth. And not just that, it also helped in controlling macrofomina physiolina. Uh, macrofomina is a notorious fungus plant pathogen, and it causes the um, yield reduction in more than 500 crops. So we were quite happy to see where Coldiria contaminants was uh, holding, uh, arresting the growth of macrofomina quite well. If you see this, uh, mm, Liquid culture, this is macrofomina growing happily uh, with uh, uh, making uh, lots of melanin, very healthy. But when we use barcolderia in macrofomina, it seems to lose that capability of producing melanin. The color is gone. And for this reason of what, we didn't know at that moment, but um, macrofomina's growth was being arrested not just macrofomina, a number of other fungi, uh, fumigate, uh, aspergillus, fumigators, and xylevia, many different rhizoctonia solani. They were also being, uh, their growth was also being arrested by macrofomina. So we decided to work on its proteomics. We wanted to find out at the proteome level what the, um, what, uh, how macrofomina uh, was being targeted uh, how, sorry, excuse me, how Burkholderia was targeting macrofomita to 
arrest its growth. And when we did the uh, proteome analysis, uh, we found a number of proteins were upregulated. Mostly the proteins that were upregulated were involved with energy production or related to its defense. But we also found a good number of downregulated proteins. And this was mainly to do with oxidative stress protection pathways and the virulence genes were also downregulated and that is why one of the that was the one of the reason why macrofomina was losing its virulence but we found what we found that uh, uh, one of the proteins that was downregulated was nitro, uh, was mm, nitrogenase no i'm trying to forget mm, sorry can't remember the name one of the enzymes uh, I don't know, I can't remember the name, what one of the enzymes involved in uh, making uh, melanin. So that enzyme was being downregulated. So we guess that was the reason why macrofomina was not being able to produce uh, melanin. And without the production capacity of melanin, it was also lo losing its virulence and was not being effective in uh, uh, in uh, infecting or making, uh, it was not being lethal to, uh, for, uh, excuse me, for chewed. So, so what we, we went on to study how this was, what was happening at the uh, molecular level by which macrofomina's growth was being arrested by Burkhold area. So we, we were happy, we found this Burkholderia from uh, a plant, a jute plant, which was uh, which is resistant to macrofomina. There's a, a jute plant, which is uh, not the two which are far more popular. They are not resistant to macrofomina, but there's a jute plant, which is not high yielding, but it is quite, uh, it is a uh, trilocularis, capsularis trilocularis, which is resistant to uh, macrofomina. And we found Burkholderia from uh, trilocularis, and this Burkholderia was having a big uh, effect on reducing the growth of macrofomina. And we now wanted to be at the proteome level, we found which genes were being downregulated when we found the gene involved in melanin synthesis were downregulated. And we, we went on to do the GC mass of the Burkholderia contaminated, uh, Burkholderia uh, challenged uh, macrofomina pezzolina. And when we did, analysis of the products through GC mass, we found catechol was uh, being produced and catechol is an antifungal, has antifungal activity. It acts as a um, suicide substrate inhibitor of tyrosinase. So this is the enzyme, tyrosinase. Tyrosinase in, is, is involved in making uh, melanin and this tyrosinase was being targeted by the catechol that was being produced when um, Burkholderia was challenging macrofomina. So this is, we established it through the GC mass work that catechol was increased, getting increased. And then this was uh, reducing the activity of tyrosinase. And because of that, the tyrosinase was, what happens is, uh, let me, I cannot say this. This uh, aprosorium, which the spore forms, and it uh, infects, it's used for infecting the host cell. This production is stopped when there's no melanin. So we understood to some extent why melanin, which was not being produced in Burkholderia challenged macrofomina was preventing its uh, aggression. It was no more, it was living. It didn't, uh, when we used uh, this Burkholderia challenged macrofomina later on, we found it to survive, but it was not virulent. So it was living, but it was, it has lost its virulence capacity. We, uh, when we did the genome of Burkholderia contaminants, we found it produced uh, pyrolonitrin, which is an anti-fungal uh, agent. And so we knew from the genome that it produces, Burkholderia produces pyrolonitrin, and this is an antifungal agent. We went on to purify the antifungal product 
from this uh, from Burkholderia, and when we purified it, we found it to be viral nitin. So this is some work that we proved how uh, Burkholderia was, excuse me, was working to prevent the invasion of uh, macrophomena. And next, uh, I'll move on to another aspect of my work, which is not related to uh, plant uh, growth improvement or biocontrol uh, activity of the endophytes, but just, this is slightly different. Among the um, bacterial isolates, we had a number of uh, Staphylococcus, and one was Staphylococcus hominis. And obviously, you'd get, you'd wonder why uh, a pathogen could be found in a uh, and as an endophyte. So we again we did the sequencing of this uh, endophytic isolate um, Staphylococcus hominis, and after the sequencing, we found that this uh, bacteria didn't have most of the pathogenic genes, the virulent genes, and whatever genes there were there related to pathogen or virulence didn't have the complete uh, genome cluster. So, but while we were doing the analysis, we found that it contained the gene sequence, a complete structure, the cluster of an um, antibiotic. This is a peptide antibiotic, which are known uh, because of the certain structure known as lantibiotics. So we found this lantibiotic from, uh, from the genome sequence. Uh, and uh, since we were isolating it from corcorus, and this was from a bacteria known as Staphylococcus hominis, we went on to name it homicorsin. And we found uh, from the genome sequence that it had the whole gen cluster for making homicorsin, which is a lantibiotic with special uh, amino acids in them, dehydroalanine, dehydrobutyrene. So, and they have ring structure also. So this was what was predicted from the genome. We went on to do the de novo sequencing by isolating the uh, peptide from uh, Staphylococcus hominis and doing the trypsin digestion and then HPLC and then uh, mass spec to find out the sequence. Uh, from So again, from the de novo sequencing, we established what, what was there in the genome was actually the same protein that we had isolated. And... Uh, we did a number of work to establish that it was the genome. What we were identifying, uh, had identified in the genome was the sequence that we had obtained. And I'm not going to the details. We found uh, several, actually, uh, we thought it was a single protein, but when we did the isolation, they were in close, very close uh, molecular mass with a difference of three Daltons or 14 Daltons or 29 Daltons. We found uh, several variants of this uh, homicorsin. And we think the variations are to do with uh, one arginine being oxidized to glutamic acid for the differences that we observe, and our isoleucine converted to valine. And the first one we, ha we had in the genome sequence, an enzyme which converted dehydroalanine to hydroxypropionate. So this we could uh, uh, make clear why was this difference happening, but we have no clue how these changes have been made. We are still working on it. And I guess with that, I will stop here. Oh, we did the, we tried to find out how this homicorsin worked. We did the um, scanning electron microscopy. This is the control cell without any uh, treatment with the lantibiotic. This is Nisin, another well-established uh, lantibiotic available in the market. We treated uh, uh, the cells, in, this is Micrococcus luteus with homicorsin, and we we identified homicorsin is uh, bactericidal in nature, and it uh, in the susceptible cells it makes pores, and then it reduces it inhibit it in the integrity of the membrane is lost. That's how it works as an, an uh, antibacterial agent. So. I'll stop here. This uh, work on jute, as you'll find out, I started um, basically, okay, we are working on the heterologous expression of the homicorsin gene. So, oh, sorry. I, 
<laughs> I still have uh, this. I wanted to also mention this. Uh, we have uh, identified uh, from the Jude uh, endophytes a fungus known as Gramothelia lineata. Uh, so, Gramothelia lineata, we have the two uh, um, classes, Ascomycota and the Basidomycota. Basidomycota is the one which is least studied, and Gramothelia lineata belongs to Basidomycota. We found that this, uh, again, we did this genome sequencing of Gramothelia lineata, and we found that the sequence showed that uh, it has a cluster for producing ipothelon. Ipothelon is a um, anti-cancer drug, which is more potent than taxol. And only one organism, sorangium, has been known to produce ipothelon. And G lineata from the genome sequence, it was predicted that it produces ipothelon. We went on to purify it and we did the mass spec and we are showing that it does produce ipothelon. There are different variants of ipothelon. So it, we see here that it, it produces ipothelon B and D. This is the same Gramothelia lineata that we had earlier identified as a good uh, taxol producer or taxol producer. But this is, I want to mention here one thing. With uh, this taxol production, we found Gramothelia lost the capability of producing taxol after, gen, after co-culture for quite a few generations. And we were quite surprised that this was happening. Uh, and we found from the literature, this is quite a common event. So this is an unfortunate event that we have. We showed it to be a producing Bactritaxel, but it doesn't produce anymore. But with others, uh, ipothelon, we have tried several times of co-culturing and we still find it to be producing ipothelon. So in that respect, there are some compounds which we don't know why a uh, uh, endophyte stop producing it. It must be due with the epigenetic environment it has been removed from, or there are many um, unsupported uh, date in literature which says that uh, some of the pathways are um, present, uh, part of the pathways present in the plant and part of the pathways present in the endophyte and the two pathways together um, work to form of certain compounds when, and when they are separated, the two pathways are not complete. So they are not able to produce the uh, that compound. This has to be uh, I, I, I don't. I haven't come across any strong data to support this, but uh, an epigenetic environment could be a reason. Uh, I think I will stop here, and mm, this is my journey, which began in 1996. We started with developing. Mm, markers. We use it for understanding the diversity of jute. Then we use the same for studying stress tolerance in jute, and we developed an implant method for transformation. And then came the jute genome project. We had some work on the novel jute uh, microRNA, which I haven't discussed here. And we did the lignin engineering, then we came across the endophytes with disappearing and the pathogen resistant genes of jute. And we are trying to identify uh, bioactive compounds from jute endophytes. And as a jute scientist, I must end by saying it's a wonder crop. And when I started working on jute, I had very little knowledge about it. It's such a wonderful crop. It has this strong, uh, long tap root. And when it grows, it goes deep down into the soil. It uh, breaks the plow pan and enriches the uh, microbial population around. Uh, and uh, it enriches the soil. And till it's harvest, it, it's so, uh, I mean, environment friendly. Uh, it takes in more, it gives more to the soil than the, it takes in as fert in terms of fertilizer. So we still have so much to learn about jute. And uh, I think we still have a long way to go in value adding, uh, making the jute fiber, uh, value adding more to it. And I'm sure there are many scientists here 
uh, are, I mean, as Shubha was saying, he also is very interested in jute. And jute is a crop we can work together, I mean, for many years to come. I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you, Shubha. Thank you, everyone, Tahamina and Shuma. Let me stop sharing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's a wonderful journey. And uh, what is interesting, at, at, uh, you, you open up so many directions for us also. And now it's uh, quite interesting to uh, know from you that uh, we, we are all know your contribution in genomics and your genome sequencing, transgenics and lignin pathway. But uh, your recent work is also one dimension. And one interesting thing is it's uh, related, it help others to enter in the jute field because it's related to microbiology, biochemistry, biotechnology. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not only the microbes, it's, it's an opportunity to everyone to come up and join the jute research in the future. Thanks ma'am for your uh, so dedicated contributions. Sir, uh, ma'am, I, I collected a few questions, but uh, you wanted to start your interaction session first. And in the meantime, I collected more questions related to today's work. And I request all the attendees, please put your questions here. And uh, after the interaction session, I will give you the password and activate the feedback thing. Thanks. Shoma, please do the interaction section. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Welcome everyone to the interview session section of today's webinar. You were listening to the renowned plant scientist, Professor Hasina Khan from the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Ma'am, uh, it was a wonderful journey that we heard. Uh, uh, we will be very happy to hear about your journey as a researcher and um, more so uh, uh, how, you how you were motivated to build a career in science. Okay, uh, I face this question quite often. I come from a very big family. I have uh, six brothers, and five of them older than me, only one younger. And these brothers, they all went into science. They will all study science, talk about science. And of course I got, I mean, I had to like, uh, it was always uh, something my brothers were trying to reach, grow up in doing, mm, something big in life and science and that I would be thinking why not me I would also do what they are doing so that's how I got interested in science from my brothers they had a big influence that's great to hear um, ma'am uh, what do you think is the prospect of plant fibers and its other diversified products Oh, there's a huge prospect. I uh, went to uh, Malaysia. They grow a similar crop, uh, kinaf, which is not the fiber is not as good as uh, jute. And uh, they, they, uh, Malaysia a uh, few years ago was growing a lot of tobacco and the government wanted to take tobacco away and introduce something to the uh, farmers that would, they would be benefited from. And then uh, Kinaf was introduced and within just a few years, they had so many industries cropping up from the Kinaf in uh, production. They had obviously packaging industry was there, but also we went to visit a place uh, in Malaysia called Malacca where they were making uh, um, army vest with uh, um, and jute fiber enforced because jute has a strong tensile strength. And so, so strong that they were considering using and making armor uh, vest. So there's so many other attributes. And I think as I was mentioning, I hope one day we can use jute as a textile fiber, use jute as a source of biofuel. These are some aspects that still remain for us to work on and improve jute so that they, we can be using it for that purpose. Um, so talking about uh, the industries, uh, according to you, which sectors of plant science research will prosper in the near future? Uh, I think understanding, translating the information of the host micro, uh, microbiome uh, interaction, translating it, that would have a big influence. As I mentioned, it's considered the third uh, revolution 
the work on microbiome. So that's going to have a big influence, not just the host microbiome, plant uh, microbiome, it's also the soil that's going to influence. And since it's becoming very easy to do metagenomics work, and this is going to be a big thing in the forthcoming agricultural revolution. Uh, what is your opinion on the CRISPR genome editing tool? And do you consider CRISPR crops to be GM crops? <laughs> I mean, I will know. We recently had a seminar in Bangladesh, a webinar, uh, where this question also came up. In fact, when I was doing my work on uh, my artificial microRNA, I was like arguing this is not uh, transgenic because... Uh, it should not be regulated in the same way. But in, uh, of course, we were using, uh, I, I was using um, this marker, antibiotic marker. So it was there introduced in the plant. So CRISPR, I think, um, should not be considered similar to other transgenic work. I think uh, CRISPR should be uh, I think in, there's, we will soon have something, a regulation coming up. Most countries don't have any regulation as such, but I think CRISPR should not go through this rigorous, uh, I mean, I've been put off, as I said, of getting biosafety clearance for the transgenic plants that I generated, but CRISPR should not be treated the same way. Uh, Ma'am, in the recent past, Bangladesh was in the limelight for GM crops commercial, commercialization in Asia. So what is in your opinion on GM crop commercialization in Bangladesh. What is your opinion on it? I mean, what is my opinion? It has been introduced and so far uh, the farmers have been benefiting from it. And uh, so I'm quite happy that our minister at that time was quite bold and took this initiative in introducing it. And Today or tomorrow, it's going to come because uh, we were getting, um, the problem was more acute with the use of so much insecticides during the lifetime of a uh, eggplant because that's only GM crop we have introduced so far. So with the um, use of so much in insecticide, it was so harmful for the environment. In that respect, the GM eggplant is much better. And I think our minister has done a very good job in introducing it. Uh, Ma'am, you have uh, many strong international collaborations. Uh, could you give us some suggestions on how to maintain such collaborations internationally? Okay, if you are, uh, first of all, it, it's a good uh, to, like, even if you don't know someone and you know their work is good, just write to them. And there's so many times you'll be surprised to see how quick they are in responding, especially in terms of collaboration, because uh, now all good work, all good publications, they have so many names in them because they are collaborating all over the world. And uh, it's not very difficult. And with this time and age when it's so easy to get access to their details of contact details. So one should just write to them. It works. And of course, you have to have a good, um, if you have good publications, but if you write to them, they'll certainly have more faith in working with you. Uh, Ma'am, you are a reviewer for uh, many renowned journals and editor of books. Uh, can you give us some key takeaway messages to improve manuscripts? The more you read uh, relevant uh, publications, the more you become aware how it should be written. So one doesn't need much uh, guide in that respect because for me also it has worked. The more I read other people's work and I knew how to write. And the more I read, obviously it enriched my work also. So I used their data to mm, support my work or to argue against their work. So that did help. So what's important is reading. And when we were like uh, your age, we had so much problem accessing all those publications but now it's so easy. So just keep up to date. You have to be up to date with the people doing the kind of work that you're doing. And the more you read, use, use that in your publication uh, in the manuscript that you're preparing and it becomes very strong. And no one can argue, I mean, put you down if you have a strong argument. Uh, when you hire a researcher or a fellow, uh, what qualities do you look for other than academic qualities? 
Okay. Uh, first of all, the tenacity, because I'm a very a bad taskmaster. I take them to task if they're not like <laughs> they should come early in the morning and work whatever it, it takes for them to finish your work. So uh, to bear with me, first of all, to bear with me. But obviously they uh, should have that interest in them. I've seen many who do not have a very good I mean, uh, degree may not be the toppers, but they have something in them, that eagerness to learn. And they would come up and suggest things. I've been always, maybe I didn't say that today, but I've always thanked my students because they would come up and tell me, this is something has happened in some other work. They have found this. We could try it. We could try this way. This we could try. And also in our conditions we do, where we do not have the best set up, the infrastructure required to do a certain work, they would come up and think out of the box and tell me we can go about this way instead of having to use that very expensive, which we don't have an equipment. So I've been benefited from them. And uh, this is something I look in them. They should come and challenge me. The way you're doing this is not correct. I've been challenged so many times. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to mention, uh, I mean, uh, accept it, that they have challenged me and have proven to be wrong. They have told me that this is not the right approach we are taking to solve this problem. So these are not the top toppers who have come to suggest things. What have we have found in my uh, lab, the ones who do very good in the grades are always eager to do better, get better grades, and they would not put long hours in research. They would put more time in studying, cramming to do well in their uh, grade, in their written exams. But for others, I've found they're more interested in research. They read more to find out as how a certain research can be conducted and made better. So the eagerness to learn and read and come up with solutions to some problems that we have. That's something I... Um, how important is women empowerment in global agriculture and science? In science, I think uh, it's very, very important because uh, uh, I, I mean, telling from myself, if I'm managing a house, the way I manage the house, I equal, I put equal uh, efforts in managing my lab, and it works very well because I know how how I have to. Uh, women are, uh, I mean, jugglers. They have to juggle so many things at one at any one time. So we are very good at juggling. We juggle with work at home, with the work in the lab. So I think in that way, they're very good and. For a long time now, I've had a, woman, a young a female researcher as my lab manager. They would handle the lab so well and not take care of my uh, procurements and look after so that everything is in order and also carry out their own research. So it's very important, at least for research. In agriculture, I'm not in a position to tell you I mean, but in agricultural research, of course. So uh, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, so what would your final words of advice be to the students and scholars who are new to the field of plant science research? Uh, uh, I've had many students work with me for their masters and then go away and work on something else, not plants. And one of my students, he was like, it was so funny. He said, why work with plants? It doesn't, I mean, doesn't respond to anything we do. I mean, I would argue why it responds by growing well or it responds by doing this. No, no, no. It's much better. No, I'm saying this because there are many uh, young uh, people who have this mindset that plant science is not like, uh, it's not glamorous. I mean, there's more glamour in doing research on cancer or mm, trying something else on a cell regulation. Uh, so those are more, more like uh, the trendy thing to do, but plant science uh, is so much there to offer. This is something you feel so good that, uh, especially in countries like Bangladesh, agriculture is such a big thing. And if you do agriculture research and give your input to its improvement means so much. And uh, it's very rewarding. 
at least when I think I've done something on jute, brought the marginal crop to the limelight and focus the, the policymakers are focusing their attention on jute, giving more grants to see how jute fiber could be better, improve better. So this plant science is very attractive and with the new dimension coming in between the plants and the microbial interaction. And this is, uh, where you learn about microbiology, as Shubha was saying, and then bio biochemistry and plant biology. It's a very exciting field. I would tell that to our youngsters. Don't think studying cancer, doing research on, on humans is much more interesting than working on plants. It's so much more interesting and rewarding at the same time. That's amazing to hear from you, ma'am. Um, so I'll go back to Shubho now and see if we have... Uh... Also motivate us to to uh, the bioengine platform also that uh, we started for promoting plant science. And mm -hmm. uh, we, it, it, your talk and uh, like you, all the eminent scientists, those are giving this talk in the platform will also rewarding for us that uh, we admire your work in different way, but it's uh, interaction and make more confident to us and our viewers that, okay, these people work in the, that way so we can do in, uh, in our journey. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I have collected few questions, but uh, I found four, three, two, three related to uh, today's or your topic. Uh, like uh, one uh, uh, Shujan, he wanted to know that uh, what will be the future of jute genomics? Uh, is, is there any opportunity and what will be the, uh, his question is, what is the future and continuation of jute genome sequencing? Uh, from uh, my work, I can say that the jute genome sequence helped me identify the lignin biosynthetic pathway and which I used for uh, um, targeting sequences for downregulating the lignin um, production of lignin. So that's one aspect. And I know there are people working on um, uh, the fiber, uh, the pathway for fiber production and how it can be improved. And that's the group in uh, Jute Research Institute. And I'm sure there are other aspects uh, which can be used, but uh, as I said, from my own point of view, I targeted the lignin biosynthetic pathway from the Jute genome sequence, and it has helped me. And at the moment I'm using also, I must tell you that I was, we have this reference genome that was sequenced, mm -mm, the Jute, and I'm using, as I said, the doing the sequencing of a jute plant that can germinate at 16 degrees centigrade and use the reference genome to find out the difference in the genomic sequences and find out from that how this one which germinates at 16 degrees centigrade, what attribute it has, how, how its genomic makeup is helping it I mean, grow at 16 degrees. Yes, and uh, uh, similar questions uh, from a, a participant from Philippines, Dania Rose Torres. Is there any genome? Is is there any jute genome project in ongoing in Philippines? In Philippines, hmm. uh, he wanted to know that is there any pro ongoing project of on jute genome in Philippines? Uh, um, I must. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm very sorry. Difficult I to know. answer. Yes, yes. Uh, how but do I know there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. lot of work in China. Okay. A lot of work on China on the transcriptomics and genomics related work on jute and in uh, Thailand to some extent, and of course, India, Bangladesh. These are the countries I know. Uh, one uh, participant, Vijay Kumar, he wanted to know, uh, uh, do you have find any anti-cancer agent in jute uh, microbe analysis? Okay, uh, jute, what analysis? Uh, microbes and jute analysis. Like, okay. uh, you know. uh, I mean, uh, this is a long um, and traditional, um, I mean, view that uh, people hold. We use the, uh, the small jute plants as a vegetable. 
and it it has a bitter uh, taste to it and this is a um, knowledge that has been long been held that it is anti cancerous in nature this but there were nothing we do not have any uh, valid validation work to i mean to validate any work to validate that but what i have found from my work on this uh, jute microbiome that this uh, gramothelial lineata a fungus growing happily in jute, it produces epithelon. And uh, we found that it produces paclitaxel, but it doesn't produce it when it's taken out of the jute plant. So I was wondering, are these microbiome giving the plant that uh, um, antimicrobial, uh, anti-cancerous, that um, attribute that we knew this uh, jute plant has? So is it from the plant itself? or is it coming from the microbes that live within the plants but i as i must confess i haven't studied the jute genome in uh, details to find out what genes there are that could have an anti cancer activity so uh, that is something i cannot tell you and uh, one last question uh, uh, shonali uh, asks from the youtube live chat that can jute uh, can jute grown in a, as a side crop? Um, I, I think uh, side crop means you know, which is not the main crop. In, it is uh, growing in a vicinity of a main crop. So her question is, uh, jute can be grown as a side crop? It is a uh, question. So it's a little bit agriculture related, I, I think. Uh, yes. and. Uh, uh, I think uh, jute uh, not actually growing as a side crop, uh, but uh, uh, what what happened is its height is so long, so it can be uh, hamper a little bit and create the shadow to the lower grounded crop. So I think no one use jute as a side crop. Maybe her interest is. It is. It, is I mean, it only has a lifetime of one twenty days, so not yes. that long. So. You, after yeah. harvesting, you could use that field for something. So maybe it is related to agronomy field we talking about. Okay, ma'am, these are the few questions and I collected uh, others and I will send you um, by mail these questions. And uh, there are a lot of appreciation. I'm sure Tamina also um, following this YouTube uh, live chat and there he, he, she will also update you. There are a lot of appreciation, lot a lot of people are exciting about your work and uh, many people are uh, congratulate you for your contrib contribution in the science uh, okay. you, as you uh, involve so heavily involved and betterment for the science. Ma'am, okay. it's our honor and uh, definitely uh, uh, personally I, I, I keep you keep in touch with you because uh, my you, my my research a little bit with uh, on your path so it's uh, wonderful if i get some advice and suggestion from you in the future and uh, uh, we are very lucky that uh, today we have you in this platform uh, and i must thank tamina shoma for helping this webinar and uh, so so this is uh, the end of our today's uh, webinar uh, and interaction. So uh, it's it's a wonderful and so thank learning. You, uh, thank you to all of you for uh, asking me here. It was my honor. It's always uh, such a pleasure to speak to young people like you about my work. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamina for uh, arranging such a wonderful talk and communicating ma'am so so many times and uh, um, thanks uh, and i'm sorry i didn't did not say sorry in the beginning i'm sorry to have postponed the time once i'm no, very no, sorry it, it's okay, okay. Ma we, we we know that uh, your schedule and that that is the reason we put one or two talk in a month so if there is any postponed so not go inside with the other and uh, we all uh, are working in the, our lab so it also uh, give us some time to arrange a talk so that that is the 
reason that we keep a distance and uh, no problem I mean, it's it's uh, we updated and for, for today's world it's very easy to update everybody that it's postponed and it's uh, CDL, just one mail it creates that uh, thanks ma'am thank you thanks all the participants to uh, okay. watching thanks. this yeah. webinar so um, and uh, thanks, uh, Tamina. Thanks, and uh, Shoma for uh, helping me to conduct this successful uh, webinar. It is it is our forty three webinar. We'll meet uh, again in January. Uh, there is a webinar on January, and we in between uh, early or early February, we try to uh, uh, try to make a webinar come workshop related uh, work on CRISPR, how to design the CRISPR uh, uh, targeted RNA. It's not the talk of CRISPR. We already did two, three webinars on CRISPR, but now how to design the target sequence and targeted RNA for that. So it's a workshop or webinar, whatever you say. You, you, uh, we demonstrate the website, demonstrate the tool here and in the meantime, you can do in your computer and ask the question to the speaker. The speaker is a very good friend of me and doing the postdoc in the USA. So uh, keep in touch. And one little bit alteration we did uh, in certificate, we update the mail. Thanks. Now time to end the webinar. Thanks, webinar of this year. <laughs> Yes, no, it is okay. the webinar. Happy New Year uh, to all of you. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> and Merry Christmas to you. You, you. you feel the enjoyment in US. Yeah. And <laughs> already start the vibes in US for the weekend. And uh, Happy New Year to everyone uh, in advance. Happy New Year to Tamina also. Yeah, Bye. Happy New Year. <laughs> Bye. Okay, take leave okay. now. Okay, ma'am. Okay. okay, thank, thank you. you ma thank you. Uh, thank you, thanks. Tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, Tamina. It was wonderful to see you. Uh, yeah. Soma, you may stop the meeting, recording, and live uh, everything. Um, and just stop the live streaming.